Hello, everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on Rashpixel.fm. I'm Pete Wright, and right over there is Nikki Kinzer. Hello! The delightful Nikki Kinzer. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, don't you feel like sometimes when we do this show, we need the movie guy to introduce? Yes. Both of well, us? Well, movie guy slash... You thought you knew her. Casey Kasem. From her organizing podcast. Wait till you'll hear her talk about ADHD. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> That's almost kind of creepy. <laughs> How are you doing, Nikki Kinzer? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. We're in the heat of November. And I mean heat, not temperature, but pace. My goodness, November is a crazy month. I know. It's just, oh, it's, it's just crazy bananas. to me that it's the end of the year already. I know. It, we just did taxes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's almost tax season again. Yeah. Ugh. That's how I kind of, that's how I mark my year. By really? Way, it's really tax weird. season? Why do, I don't know. How did that, it's tax season. Uh, yes. And so that's very frustrating. Uh, but it is NaNoWriMo. That's right. You know, I think I talked to you. I'm writing a novel. Awesome. That's hard. That's hard to do with ADHD. And you're doing it every day? You're writing it a little bit every day? A little bit every day. Well, a little bit. 2,000 words. Wow. That's uh, more than a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's it's right about eight pages. And so I have to, oh, I have to do all the things, you know, I have to do all the things. I put the headphones on. Oh, my goodness. I found a playlist called Pure Focus on Apple Music. And I'm sure there's a similar podcast on, um, you know, Spotify, if you're a Spotify subscriber. I'm an Apple Music subscriber. I love it. This Pure Focus playlist, it is all uh, like instrumental music this fantastic music that i just love and it's like seven hours long it just it just goes this this background music and that's the kind of music that i need in my head when i'm trying to really focus and and work on something that Mm -hmm. doesn't involve other people's voices um is i need to put my headphones on and i just need to zone into something else and that keeps me going it lets me get exactly where i need to go so i love this Uh, wow do i ever well, you'll to have to put that in the show notes. I will. I will put a show a, a link to if you're an Apple Music subscriber. Whoo, jump on this pure focus playlist. It's great. So yeah, I've been going. I try to go to different places every day. I try to shake up the the external stimuli. Mm-hmm. Uh, always have the headphones on. Um, I'm, I'm trying to do. There's a balance, you know, between creating rituals that that help inspire me and creating enough uh, variety that I don't get bored and distracted. Uh, and that's a really fine line to walk. I'm not quite there yet in terms of absolute productivity. I've I've hit. I'm ahead of my word goal overall, but it's been hard. Uh, I'm trying to do it in multiple little sessions. You know, doing all the things that we talk about mm-hmm. uh, to Good to try to you. achieve this. But it's it's hard. If we have any listeners who are also on the NaNoWriMo 2017 train, please reach out to me uh, and and let me know. Let's uh, let's talk about what we're doing to. To get through it, because I'm telling you, it's tiring. I can imagine. Yeah. What are you wow. going to do, like in the middle of the month, and you're stuck? How are you going to well, get? Why unstuck? would you assume I'm going to be stuck in the middle of the month? That's, know, that's awfully not negative nice, of is you. It? it is negative. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I'm trying to prepare you so that you know what to do, but yeah, that's not nice. Never mind. <laughs> take I take all of that back. <laughs> all of this is staying in the show. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> this is maybe uh, this talking. is actually this is a really good reason why we're going to talk about what we're going to talk it about exactly today. Right. I'm so excited <laughs> about this because we're talking about language and the importance and language of uh, of language and the language we use uh, to so talk when about you're ourselves trying to support, and our dear friends. So lesson learned: <laughs> when you're trying to support somebody, don't just assume they're going to get stuck. <laughs> so you're going to be stuck then, huh? <laughs> what are you going to do, Pete? So you have that to look forward to. <laughs> Well, you can reach out to me and I'll get you unstuck. There you I'll go. be Thank supportive. You. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> before we jump into our language talk, head over to TakeControlADHD.com. Get to know us a little bit better. If you want. Uh, you might be a little yeah, scared of me. <laughs> you can listen to the show right there on the website or subscribe to us on the mailing list and we'll send you an email each time an episode is released. Of course, you can connect with us on Twitter or Facebook at Take Control ADHD or call us at 503-664-4ADD and get your voice and thoughts on the show. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And don't forget, five-star reviews in iTunes and Apple Podcasts and recommendations in your favorite podcast player helps others to discover the show when they need help. So pay it forward and drop us a kind review. We appreciate it. They re- appreciate it. Thank you so much. We've got a little bit of feedback. Some uh, some questions came in over the interwebs. The interwebs? <laughs> they did. They did. 
You want to read the first? Well, you should read both of them because you're such a better reader than I am. See how supportive that is? Uh, Movie guy is back. (laughs) (laughs) No, you can't be here right now. I like to read email. No. Uh, I got multiple people in the room and in my head. Here we go. Victoria (laughs) uh, has written in with a question. She says this. I'm having a hard time bridging a gap between my parents' outlook on medication and my newfound decision to start taking ADHD meds. They both come from families with addiction problems and poorly view mental health, and I'm nervous about trying to talk with them about it. I want to tell them, and I hope for their understanding and support, but they have a strong history of being gently ignorant and sweetly biased and unsupportive. I still struggle with be- with a bit with resenting how they dismissed my ADHD and tried to convince me that I should avoid medication while it's not going to change my decision if they are discouraging. They are my parents, and I want to at least try to connect with them and communicate what's going on with me. Any advice on how to go about navigating this particular situation? Uh. I really feel for her. I mean, it's sad because you want you want that support and you want them to be, um, you know, encouraging of her and, and accepting of it. But obviously, right. this is not what she has seen in the past. And so, you know, I think my when I first read this, my my thought was uh, she mentions in the email a little bit later that she's 27. So she is an adult. Yeah. And um you know, I, I think what I would do if I was in a similar situation is that you want you want to share the information with them, but you can't control how they react to it. So um, I think there's a little bit of thought that has to go into well, how what if they do react? in sort of an ignorant, you know, biased way, how are you going to react to that? And, um, but stand in your truth because you know that this is something that you want to try and something that you feel is good for you or is going to help you. And so I think that's important that you stand in that and um, be confident about your choice. But unfortunately you can't control how they're going to react. So yeah. it's, it's hard to, to navigate that because we just don't know what they're going to say. Yeah, we run into this too, you know, where you get to a certain point. I know, you know, we certainly had this challenge with, you know, grandparents, in-laws, grand-in-laws, uh, you know, who in in my own family and long history of people who hit a certain age and they just there's there it's not that they weren't ever uh flexible and able to have their minds changed, but at some point they just got tired of doing it. <laughs> so it's hard sometimes to talk to your parents about um you know something about which they are operating off of, you know, bad information, right? They're, right, they're, right. They don't they clearly what you're describing is is a set of people who have a deeply held belief about all medications and don't understand the unique properties of ADHD. ADHD medications. And we've had a number of episodes on this show now where we we have talked to experts in ADHD meds uh, and, uh, you know, have attempted to dispel the myths that surround medication and addiction. Uh, and, and so um, we know that there is constantly changing information and data about this. And the latest information is that the meds are okay, that the meds are going to open a door for you to do more things and be more present and be more aware in your relationships. And it's all great. Um, and and there may be a point that your parents are willing to sort of open their minds and hearts to to learning about the the differences of ADHD meds and current ADHD meds, and and that may be a day to really look forward to and celebrate. But um, you know, at some point, you you get to step away from your parents and you get to make your own decisions and hopefully you have resources and other peers in your social group who can uh, help care for you and give you the kind of support that you're not going to get from your parents uh, if if they're unwilling to change their mind and understand kind of what you're going through. Because the parents, just because they're parents, doesn't mean they're not human too, right? I mean, <laughs> they're... And it doesn't mean they're like, right. It doesn't mean... They, yeah, <laughs> right? because they're, yeah. they're just... They're as human as anybody else. Just because right. we have this parental relationship with them is... Uh, it, it has nothing to do with their ability to understand or, or comprehend the world any differently than, you know, um, you know, any somebody you don't know or have never met on the street. Right. It, it, they're just humans. And uh, and and so they're they're dealing with their own struggles. You can't assume that they're going to, you know, be the people who support you all the time, every time. 
Mm-hmm. It maybe you have to find that support from somebody else. Yeah. Uh, I this is an incredibly difficult situation. I certainly understand that, um, especially if you if you have otherwise a, a long and loving relationship with your parents. Uh, you know, and I, but I I just love the gently ignorant and sweetly biased uh, mm-hmm. line. That is uh, that's that is a great way to put it, and I think it really it it's it you know, you, you find a way to honor the relationship you have and honor the challenges that you are trying to find a solution for in your own life. That's it. Right. Thank you for writing, Victoria. And yes, thank you. Thank you. We and didn't best read of luck. the very long uh, note of kindness and, and uh, generous uh, compliments for this show. We, we, oh, Victoria, seriously, we read this together. It's just wonderful that you, you shared your thoughts with us via email. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, and thank you for listening. Um, okay. We've got one that I think, uh, is, is going to bring out, um, bring out the organizing Nikki. Oh, I'm excited. You think? Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. Teresa bring it has on. Written in. Yeah. She has written in the, with the following. I have a laundry monster of clothes that has hung over my head for about a year now. Clothes that fit. They don't fit. Summer, winter clothes. How do I slay this monster? If I run out of clothes, I just buy more. Help. 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 <laughs> Well, Teresa and anybody else out there that's having a closet overflowing of clothes, uh, you know, the first thing you got to do is you got to sort and purge, 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 get all, get the clothes that don't fit you, get the, the clothes that you don't like, um, or you just forgot that you even bought them and then you're looking at them thinking, why did I buy this? Oh, it's because it was on sale for $9.99 and now I think it's ugly. So, <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> right? I, I, the women out there are shaking their heads like, yeah, I know what she's talking about. <laughs> 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 so uh, definitely you got to you gotta take some time. It doesn't have to be a long time, right? We've talked about this before. It doesn't have to be a whole weekend that you devote to this, but uh, take, take, you know, 30 minutes, an hour just to go through your clothes. And, and the first thing to do is make those easy decisions and get rid of the stuff that you know you don't want and don't like. And all of a sudden you're going to find, you know, probably a couple bagfuls of clothes that are being donated and you're going to all of a sudden have more space and you're going to have more clarity because not everything's going to be mixed in um, with each other. I do highly suggest that you do this before you go and buy more clothes. <laughs> So yes. that's sort of like the don't buy the containers before you sort. Um, don't buy more clothes until you know what you need and and uh, really go through that step. So try stuff on. Uh, if you don't like it, put it in the donation. If you haven't worn it in a year, you know, I know that that's a standard rule, but it's a good one. Um, you probably aren't going to wear it again. So let it go and just really try to eliminate as much as you can. I, I promise you it will make things a much, much easier for you in the mornings if you have less. And remember that we do, uh, wear, what is it? 20% of our clothes, 80% of the time. So all of those other clothes that we're not wearing, we are, you know, we're mas- we're, we're masters of habit, right? We, we tend to wear uniforms and, um, anything that you're not wearing on a regular basis, if you are going to keep it, make sure that it's not front and center in your closet. Make sure that it's put away more um, in inconvenient spots. And the, 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 the areas that you have easier access to is where you want to put that 20% that you wear all the time. That, there you go. That. Yeah, boy, that just comes out of nowhere, organizing Nikki. I know, right? She it's just weird. takes the reins. And then it's, <laughs> <laughs> I just spew <laughs> information. Slay the laundry monster. <laughs> Uh, Get rid of it, Teresa. That's We're right. We're supporting you. We're in it with you. We're in your closet right now. And I'm not going to ask you, what are you going to do halfway when you get stuck? No. Uh-uh. Wait, you just did it, Nikki. You just did it. <laughs> no, because she's not. She's going to keep going until she's done. That's right. I know. That's right. You know. I've learned from my mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> we need to talk a little bit about Patreon, can we? Yes. We sure hope to educate you guys a little bit more about what Patreon is, what you can get out of it, and uh, and, and why we're doing it. It is at patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. Patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. If you visit the Patreon account for this show, you have an opportunity to, well, frankly, give us money. Uh, and that is a way to support this show. For seven years, we have given this show away uh, for free. Uh, we've, we 
plan every week. We work hard to, to give content that we, we feel like is, is going to benefit our community and continue to grow the community and support those who, who are you know, struggling with ADHD. And, and our hope is that uh, if you appreciate what we have, have given uh, to the community for the last seven years, that you will in, in turn um, share a little bit with us uh, through our Patreon account for as little as a buck a month. Five bucks a month gets you into the, uh, the, our soon-to-be-launched Facebook private group uh, where we're hoping to really build a, a vibrant community of those you know, seeking support from one another too. Uh, shared listeners uh, who have a, a shared interest in this show and, and learning more about their ADHD, we want to create this this place where um, you know we can we can all be a part of, of the journey together. So what we have heard is that there are some folks who may not understand kind of what Patreon is, uh, and and so I'm, I hope to just continue to explain it a little bit each week, uh, so in, in, until we have kind of a good sense of of what Patreon is, what it can do. Um, and and how it's supporting this show. It is just a tool, like public radio. You know, if you're ever listening to your favorite NPR show, uh, you know, once every six months, you, they go for a week and they'll uh, they'll do a pledge drive uh, where they ask you to just send in some money if you like what you're getting for free. Uh, and that's what we're doing. Patreon is a way to support the show just like public radio um, and um, and except for you know it's up and running all year long <laughs> you can join anytime mm-hmm. uh, so what do you think Nikki what do you think about Patreon well I think it, it, it allows us to do more with with what we want to do with the show and with the listeners in the community and and one of the things that I'm really excited about is the Facebook community and and really getting this um built up so that people can talk about the show that week we can talk about past shows like you can say hey did you guys listen to episode you know 201 whatever um and really have that 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 dialogue and and pete and i want to jump in we're going to answer questions we're going to join in with you with these conversations and do some facebook lives and and really want to engage with you um where it's just not me me and pete talking (laughs) and we're hoping you're listening um but it's hard to do that. We can't do that without having some kind of income coming in because it does take a lot of time, and um, you know it 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 it, it, it always when you, when you it kind of feels weird to ask, right? Yeah. Um, and and I'm just being honest with that because I know podcasts are free, um, but it is also something that we want to we want to grow. We want to give you more and. Uh, my time is limited and Pete's time is limited and we want to make this happen. And, um, this is the way to make it happen. So it, it is, you go. It, you're absolutely right. It is really hard to ask mostly because we love podcasting. Like we, we do it yeah, because it's not we going love away. doing it. Right. Yeah. It's not the podcast. <laughs> and, and if you don't, if you don't give, that's totally okay. We're not, totally <laughs> we're fine. not going anywhere. Make, make no. smart financial decisions first, but, yes. uh, but we <laughs> certainly appreciate you uh, considering uh, being a part of the Patreon community and, and, um, you know, we'll continue to figure out ways to to grow uh, as as it grows. So that's yes. it. That is our Patreon break for the day. Let's talk about language. Language. Now, I I start. I think I I said something about binary language a long time ago, and I think that threw uh, some folks for a loop. Well, it threw me for a loop. It did. I don't know if you said it to the to the group or to the podcast listeners. But I don't know. I may have. But I think you said it to me yeah. because I remember us talking about the word structure, mm-hmm. and which we'll talk about here in a, in a minute. But um, yeah, but I looked it up to see what it meant, and it was all about computer code. Yes, the like programming in binary, right? Uh, well, and I'm and, like binary. I don't know why we. I don't think we want to talk about computer code. Well, we're not talking about. <laughs> co- see, the the problem is all about context. If you just look up binary language, you're gonna get you're gonna get stuff about computers, right? Because computers yeah. are, are exist in binary ones or zeros. And I actually think this is really helpful as a way to kind of frame the conversation, right? When you're speaking in binary language, you're speaking in language that has uh, it has only this or that. Like there's no gray area in the language. There's no room to explore, grow, learn. It's either a one or a zero in computer parlance. It's either a set of two extremes, right? You're either on or off, right? You mm-hmm. either, you're either you either smart or dumb. You're either organized or disorganized. There is no room for any other conversation. And that's what I was talking about, right? It's I about, see. you know, it's about a set of terms not a set of numbers in computer code, but a set of two terms that define how you think about yourself and the opportunities that are in front of you um, in in terms of binary 
language? What is the language that you use about yourself? And then we get this comment uh, from uh, Alyssa, who uh, inspired you. Do yes. you want to read it? Do you want me to read it, or you want Movie Guy to read it? Oh, I don't really want Movie Guy to read it, because that would kind of take it. I think a- you're not exploring Movie Guys, the opportunity that comes with Movie Guy enough, but I'll go ahead and read it <laughs> okay. for now. <laughs> We'll talk about Movie Guy offline. I am in the middle of the emotional distress syndrome episode, says Alyssa, and I want to tell you how much it meant to hear the three of you go back and forth dissecting the words manage versus navigate. I thought about people in my life who would not think the difference is significant or who would accept the change but not want to spend time to unpack it. It's heartwarming to know that there are people who believe in the power of words and who who care deeply enough to evolve their vocabularies to avoid potentially harmful language. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alyssa. Now, how did Alyssa inspire you, Nikki? Well, when she wrote this in, and I, I thought about it, and I and I remember you wanted to have this conversation a long time ago. Mm-hmm. And that's where I was like, okay, universe is speaking, and I'm listening. <laughs> and so I decided that this was going to be the, the topic for today. I love it. <laughs> So that was the inspiration, honestly, is because it, it meant something to her. And I thought, well, this is a really important subject. And and you wanted to talk about it a long time ago, and it just never fit. And yeah. I just feel like now is the time where it fits. I think it really does. You, you know, the the episode that she was, uh, Alyssa was referring to was her episode with James Ochoa, episode 314. Uh, so you can go back and find it. And it, it's worth listening to because, you know, figuring out just the difference between managing and navigating um, it is an important one, and it changes the way you you think about kind of the way you relate with the world. I know it has for me, and it, I've only been thinking about this kind of change for the last several months. Um, mm-hmm. But it, it's, it really does make a difference. Do you notice? Oh, yes, definitely. Well, and I think that um, there's a couple of examples, actually, that I have for you that, that are real ex- examples where it's been very noticeable. And uh, well, first of all, what she talked about with the, the manage versus navigate. But when the, originally when you and I were talking about this, it came from the word structure. And structure is some is a word that I use all the time, just like what I was saying when we were talking about managing. It's like I always say manage ADHD. And so I, it, it, there are things that you have to kind of retrain yourself, right, um, to look at them differently because the definition of what that may mean to someone is different than what you're looking at it as. And uh, the the word structure came up in a, in a coaching group where we were talking about how to get things done and we were trying to figure out how to how to uh, look at your to-do list and and prioritize it and how do you match it into your calendar and and how do you actually follow through right all of these things that can kind of happen. And the word structure came up and one of the people in the coaching group was just really against that word and, and very adamant that she felt like structure meant she was in a cage yeah, and, and she can't ter- get out. It's just terrifying. The word is it's just, terrifying. It, it's a trigger word. Right. It's a trigger word, yeah. which is, yeah, exactly. And so that was something that was very unsettling to her and very adamant that that was not something that, that you know, she wanted. And so together as a group, we kind of figured out, okay, what is it that we want here? What are we trying? What's the goal that we're trying to get? And how do you picture that? And what is a a different way of explaining it? So maybe structure isn't the right way to explain it, but her main goal was still to get her stuff done. And so how do we get her stuff done? And so, or how do we get her to to do these things. And so we played around with different words and we played around with different um, ways to describe it. You know, one word was systems, which I know, again, is a trigger word for many people. We also talked about scaffolding um, and how the scaffolding uh, routines and habits were helping her move up the ladder, you know, get to the final goal. And that was something that actually she felt um, better about. Now, I have something else to share with you, um, and it just dawned on me. During the ADHD um, expo that I was a part of last month, there was a gal, and I don't remember who it is, and I'm so sorry, um, but it was a coach, and uh, she explained, instead of using the word structure, to actually um, 
visualize, you know, those movie ropes movie that ropes. you see at oh, the, like the when you go to the ropes. movies. Yeah. Yeah. Like the velvet ropes that to, when you're, when you're starting a new habit or a new routine, think of it as like you're in line and you have the ability to kind of move the velvet rope when you need to. So it's there to kind of keep you on task, right? It's there to kind of keep you in line. But if you need to turn right, you can unclip the thing and still turn it and 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 move it. Yeah, right. And you can right? if you if you know you really want to, you can just blow right through it. You know you can just <laughs> yeah, walk through yeah. it and take the rope with you. But yeah. it's a guide. But it's a guide and it's a nicer way than being in a cage. Yes. It's a reminder too, right? It's just a it's just a reminder. It's just a prod that says, "Hey, this is a thing. Yes. This is a limit." Yes. So it, it is. It's just it's it's having these trigger words and these things that are, you know, they they mean different things to different people. And you know, when we were talking about organizing, organizing comes very natural to me, mm-hmm. right? I can talk about it all day. Uh, but one of the words that I don't like in the organizing world, and I don't use a lot. I'm not going to say that I never use it because I'm sure somebody will be able to play back sometime when I used it. <laughs> 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 but it is not something I use all the time. Is the word clutter? Yeah, and I've you always used to, had. A, you used to, I think, use clutter more just as a definition, right? I mean, it was like that was a word that. But I, you're right. I haven't no, heard you use it in I a mean, long time. I well, and even when I was doing a lot of organizing, I yeah. still never used it a lot. I was very careful using that word because I've always had a hard time when I think of clutter. I think of junk. I think of, um, well, it must not be worthy of being in your home. And I don't believe that. I don't yeah. believe that. I think clutter is just stuff that you haven't put away and it just needs a home. Yeah. And so I always tried to avoid using that word because I didn't want people to feel like I didn't think that their stuff mattered. It wasn't just junk. And and so anyway, that was something that really resonated with me. And then I have one more example of a word that I really love. And that's the word kind. Oh, I like that word. Yes, I think that's a really nice word. And um, to me, when I think of of somebody being kind, I think of someone who is giving something to someone with no expectation of getting anything in return. And it's a real genuine act of love and um, and care, you know, for the you want the other person to be happy or being kind. Mm -hmm. Um, So I and so that's a word I really love. And I, you know, want to use more of. And I like the word intention, which is not going to surprise anybody. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of perseverating on clutter. And it turns out I'm the one who uses clutter more than anybody else. And it's about digital clutter. Probably. The last time you used clutter in a podcast was in 2015, episode 208. But then, man, I use it all over the place. Digital (laughs) clutter, clear the clutter, digital chaos or clutter. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's hard not to ever say yeah, it because yeah. it is such a part of an organizing term, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's in the organizing world, but it is definitely something that I try to be careful of. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're you're better at it than I am for sure. Well, it is interesting because of the power of language. I mean, you know, I am embarrassed that we start this conversation or th- this show with me going straight to the negative. That's not what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the problem is that we, and this is when I was doing some yeah. research on the power of language, one of the things I found is that words do come to us so automatically and unconsciously that we tend to treat them lightly and not really think about what we're saying. Whereas you caught that on right away. Like, well, why would you just assume I would get stuck? Like, I don't know why I would assume that. Like, Well, it's so funny, right? Because that becomes a binary word, right? Because it's either you're stuck or you're not. And in this case, suddenly now I've planted that seed that there's yeah. an external force who thinks I'm going to get stuck halfway through this, right? When I'm before, so sorry. it's like it's like Schrodinger's uh, thing. You know about Schrodinger's cat? Like there's a cat in a box, and you don't know if the cat's alive or dead until you open the box. Therefore, until you open the box, the cat is both alive and dead. It's a whole oh my philosophical gosh. thing. Anyway, that sounds so weird. It's, well, it's it's Schrodinger's thing. Like before before you use the word stuck. 
I may get stuck. I may not. But once you use the word stuck, that word is planted in my head. And now that's the thing. I totally sabotaged you. You've sabotaged me. No. You know, it's such a great example and such a timely example, though, too, about how easy it is for us to do that to ourselves, right? How easy is it to be in that language of of there's just this and and one other thing, and it's probably going to be the negative because that's that's our habit. Well, and I think that from my, if I was to dig in deep unconsciously, like, what did I really mean by that? Like, where was I going unconsciously? As a coach, I think what I was doing without knowing it is help, trying to help you prepare if that happened, what are you going to do to get out of it? So I was looking at not necessarily that it was going to happen, but if it did, you know, what's going to push you along? What are your alternatives? What are your solutions to keep going? And, and that, but it wasn't the right timing either. Well, so, yeah, but you know, and, and part of it is like, there is a way to get through the middle of this whole exercise, right? The whole writing a novel thing without ever getting stuck. And that is focus day to day on the accommodations that I have in place so that I never get stuck. What am I doing today to write yeah. the next thousand words? And if, right. if I focus there, I don't ever have to put a flag on the horizon that there is a potential to get stuck, right? I I don't ever even have to approach that worst case. And that, I think, is the problem that that language sometimes, the trap that we sometimes fall into with with language. Like, if if we spend a lot of time thinking, okay, now we've got to be uh, we've got to be prepared for every horizon, we focus a lot on every horizon. When you're running a marathon, like, sometimes you just need to focus on the next foot in front of the other, right? Like right, the and next not halfway step. through. Right. Right. If I focus yeah. on mile, mile 18, then I'm not focused on mile three. And mile three, right. I have to get through today. So, right. um, so anyway, I think well, that's and really it's, interesting. It's an interesting, too, kind of off of your point. One of the things that um, I find is, you know, I'll talk to a client and they'll say, okay, well, this is, this is what I would like to try to do this week. And it's interesting when you use the word try, because if you use the word try, it's almost giving you the excuse or a way to not get it done because it's always a way out. That's that's right? that's one I keep in my back pocket, too. It's a terrible habit. <laughs> it's a terrible habit. It is it because is. we we think, well, what if we get busy? What if there's a um, a, an emergency? I mean, there's all these what ifs. But when you say, I, I will try to do this today, I will try to do this. It, it's almost like you said, now you're opening that door to have something happen. Just like when I said, what are you going to do if you get stuck? I've opened that door for you to get stuck. This is the same thing, right? I mean, if I'm trying to do something, then I'm opening the door to to not let it happen. And, and it's very, it's a very non-committal way to say something to someone. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. you're almost kind of telling them it's not going to happen. Right. Right. <laughs> right. It, yeah, it, it totally is. Like, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll try to make it out to coffee with you. <laughs> Yeah, you know what I mean? and that yeah. sounds very different than when you say, I'm going to meet with you at, yeah. co- you know, I'm going to meet you at two o'clock this afternoon, or this will be done today. There, this will be done this week. There used to be a fallback word, too, that that I think is losing meaning. It's I'm I'm planning to to meet you, you know, I'm planning to get it done. Well, pl- let's na- plan for that. Yeah, yeah. Now, now plan is kind of falling into the same trap as, as try, right? Because plans change. You know, gosh, I was planning on it, but now I'm planning on something else. (laughs) You know, I I, that brings me up to a a situation and I can't remember if I shared this already on the show or not. So I apologize if this is a um, repeat story. But I I recently had a a girlfriend of mine who we do breakfast. Did I already say this? I know not of your breakfast plans. You don't know my no. my breakfast buddy? No. Okay. Well, I have this particular friend who that's just what we do. We go and have breakfast. That's our thing. So um, we try to meet together about once a month, maybe about once a month where we go and have breakfast and catch up and, and everything. And um, we hadn't done it all summer long. And I saw her at the beginning of the school year at a um, open house thing. And she said, you know, we really got to get together. But um, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to wait for you to contact me me. So you tell me when it's a good time for you and then we'll we'll put it on the on the calendar. And I got to tell you, like I came home that night and I was like, "Whoa. I, uh, I need to contact her. Like I need to not just plan it." Yeah. 
I need to not just say, oh, yeah, we'll get together and we'll do this. It's like, and so immediately I looked at the dates and I said, okay, well, I can't meet you until two weeks from now because she likes to meet during the week and that's hard right. Right. <laughs> when you work. Right. And so I'm like, I can't, I don't have an opening until, you know, two weeks from now, but let's plan for that. And so we both had it on our calendar as an appointment and we made that breakfast happen. And so it is something like what you're saying. It's like that planning has to turn into action if it means something to you. Don't just plan it. Make it happen. And, and to her, she was settling, tell, or she in her subtle way was saying, I'm waiting for you, girlfriend. Yeah, yeah, I'll be there when you're ready. I'll be there. But you need to you need to tell me what works for you because my schedule is a lot more tighter than hers. And so she knows that. Yeah. That's and, that's uh, fascinating, and that puts a. It's an interesting. It sort of spins into a different conversation about responsibility, um, and and sort of social responsibility, and and because I can imagine, uh, I can imagine a situation where that would send me into a flat spin, right? Like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, it's too, it's too much. I can't now. I don't even know. I can't. I look at my calendar, and everything <laughs> just turns to like the Matrix code. You know, it's just I can't read right. it. Uh, uh, you know, what about travel time? Will I have time to travel to this <laughs> breakfast? <laughs> you make the time. Yeah, right. See, that was the thing too, is that, you know, when we talk about balance, now we're kind of going off of the subject of language, but I think this is important because a lot of people talk to me and ask me questions about balance. Yeah. How do you balance work and home and, and being a, a husband and a wife and a partner? And, you know, how do you do all these things? And I think you do have to make decisions and you do have to be intentional with your time and how you're going to spend it. And for me, when she said that, it was a reminder that this relationship is really important to me. And in order for us to continue it, I have to do my part and I have to make it happen. And so I took a Tuesday morning where, yes, I could have been working. I could have been doing, you know, house cleaning. I could have been doing a million other things, but I wanted to spend some time, quality time with my friend. And that's good for your soul. That's good for everything, um, your mental health, and all of that. So anyway, that's yeah. It, it's it can put you in a in a spin, but it doesn't have to. Yeah, that's good stuff. Let's uh, so let's let's jump back into the the language because you found some really great resources here on uh, sort of insights on on how to transform our language. I. Did I found a couple of articles that I put that you'll put links because you're the one that does that. I do link, right? Yeah, from time to time. <laughs> you'll put the links in there, but there were, you know, one of the articles is kind of old. I mean, it's like from 2005, but it's still really relevant. So take a look at that. Um, but yeah, there was some really good information to just again about saying I want to do something rather than you have to, and just how that changes your thought process. And we talked about this a long time ago. I remember, um, you know, I, I, I get to pay, like, I, I get to pay my mortgage today, this week. It's like, that's a, it's a privilege. I get to have a house to live. Like, I don't have to worry about this. And so even though it may be a pain and it's a lot of money and it's like, Ugh, but it's still something that we're grateful for. So it's kind of ch- changing the spin around wanting rather than having to do it. Um, this article was the power of language patterns. So when we hear something negative, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about before, these words get seared in our minds and these words then turn into life defining stories, which is what we call limiting beliefs. So this is an example of, um, how this story became someone's reality. So she was told that she was not fat, that she was just big boned. So for her, the story was, I hate my body, I need to exercise even more, but then nothing really ever works for me. Maybe there's a new diet I can try, but what if that doesn't work either? Why do other girls have it so much easier? I hate my body. Mm -hmm. That was her story. And then the reality, unfortunately, is that now she has body image issues and could lead into potential eating disorders. Just from somebody saying she's not fat, she's big boned. So the power is obviously extremely impactful. And I am talking to an audience that gets this probably more than anybody. 
Yeah, I can't. I, you know, it's the whole the whole. You know, I can't live by a schedule. Right. Uh, I I don't know how to use these tools. Like I'm overwhelmed by signal to noise. I'm like all of these things. And what I love about the this framework, right? T- turning the words into stories works really well because you're you're playing the words out to a an example that applies directly to you. Right. In this case, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, what are you going to do when you get stuck? Well, now that means okay, I'm going to get stuck. Uh, halfway through, that means I'll probably have about 20,000 words of an unfinished story. That means it's, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to move forward. That means I'll have yet another unfinished story in front of me. That means I don't finish things. Uh, that means, uh, you know, ADHD oh my is God, debilitating. I totally sabotaged you. But, but you know what I mean? No, it's, it's the, that's the, that's how you play the story out, right? Like, I know, but we need a different story. We do, but it's such a great example. That's why you, you have yes, become a I vessel know. for, for great examples of I turning know, and words. I feel terrible. No, let it go. <laughs> of turning these specific words into a story so that you know how to turn it off so that you can turn it the other way, right? Um, yes. The, the yes. words are, you know. And you did that because you said, I'm not going to get stuck. I have all of these things in place that's not that that's not going to allow me to do right, that. But so. I can only do that because I've been doing this for 14 years and I've only right. completed the project twice. Believe me, I know yeah. what it means to get stuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that I'm not scared of it anymore, right? I'm not scared right. of that because I know what happens on the other side of it. You don't finish, you feel terrible, but somehow you muster through another year to try again and this time make some changes and that's where I am and uh and changing the story. Changing the story. And so so that's that's what you have to do is take is sometimes I think you have to feel that language just enough. You have to say that language just enough so that you know what the other words are to use. Right. The words that actually make you uh, that, that make change your emotional connection to those words. And it's very practical. Use a thesaurus for crying out loud. Find some antonyms to the words right. that, that are negative and impacting your life. Like there is a practical approach to this. Y- you can change the way you think about words. By learning some Absolutely. new words. Yeah, right, right. And see how they feel when you're using them. Talk about this should detox. I know, right? Yeah, yeah this is so interesting. So in um in the second in the second article, and it's called Power of Language Words or something like that. You, you'll know. You'll put it on there in the show notes. But there's this exercise that you can do um, about should. It's a should detox. And we've talked about should before. And should is not a great word, right? Because basically what we're trying to do is is – we're trying to meet somebody else's expectations or we're stressed or guilt. There's a lot of guilt about what we're not doing. So real quick, and you'll get more information in the show notes, but there's this, this detox that you can do where you can pick something simple that you would like to do more in your life. And, uh, and, and, and so the example they use is meditating. And so you start off with, I should meditate more. Well, I've said that before. And then they say, okay, I should meditate more. Pause and observe. How does it feel for you to say that? Well, what it makes me feel like is that, yeah, I should do it, but I'm not doing it and I suck. (laughs) Right? (laughs) I mean, that's what it feels like. Like, I'm bad. I'm just not making it happen. So then step two is to replace the should with a could. So now you're saying, I could meditate more. Right. And most people raise their eyebrows and nod their head a little with the could sentence. Like, yeah, I could. I could do that. That feels a little bit more not so sucky. Right, right. It is less sucky (laughs) on the sucky scale. It's less sucky sucky. to say that I could. Mm -hmm. And then step three is to replace could with can. I can meditate more. And uh, this usually- the empowerment of time, of presence. Empowerment- of time and making that decision and energy comes up, right? All of that comes up. So I I can meditate more and I can, Pete, yes. right? I can. Hallelujah. There's no doubt, right? I like meditating. Um, and then that's the, that step four is going into can with excited to. Mm-hmm. So I'm excited to meditate more. Yeah. Because now, now there's a future like state where, it. yeah, there's a future state where it's it's one of opportunity, not not regret opportunity and shame. Opportunity and, and benefits. Yeah. And I'm really excited to do this. Yeah. And then finally, we add a because on the end of the sentence for reasons and that extra kind of motivational boost, you know, that that taps into the power of language. And so it this example says, I'm excited to meditate more because when I do... I am much more relaxed and focused. 
Oh, I like that one the best. Now for me, I would say I'm excited to meditate more because I'm more calm and centered. That's how I would mm-hmm. answer that. Mm-hmm. So everybody has their own reasons why they do things, right? right? And so anyway, I love that. And I would say, take a look at that exercise because it really does change even just the energy, you know, I should to I'm excited. It's completely different um, meanings. That's fantastic. There you, you know, go. I just did that whole exercise with uh, replacing meditate. I should meditate. I could meditate. I can meditate with subscribe to the ADHD podcast on Patreon. And you know, I'm excited to subscribe to the ADHD podcast on Patreon. <laughs> you know, it you. totally works. <laughs> All right. And we're excited to have you, Pete. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for putting up we with me. We can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> and me, because, boy, learning. It's been a, it's a, it's a tough day for, for you, Nikki. I hope you don't feel like this is a pile on, but you really are. It's a great example. No, it was great. Yeah. It was a great Perfect. example. So I hope everybody... Um, <laughs> You know, appreciates my flaw. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Uh, this was really good. Thank you so much, everybody, for uh, for your time and your attention. On behalf of Nikki Kinzer, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll catch you next week right, right here on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast. <laughs>